friends, and welcome to episode 41 of the What's Good Games podcast, a.k.a. this week it is the Brit and motherfucking Steimer show. Oh, hell yeah. Oh, hell I'm yeah. motherfucking Steimer. <laughs> I'm your host, Brittany Brombacher, joined by Salty Steimer. Yeah, hi, it's me. It's you. I got a first name, but it's not important. You got what? I missed that. I have a first name. Oh, I yeah. I got a first name. But the it's not SS important. Steimer, the Salty Saltine Steimer, that makes no sense. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have been left in care of this podcast. Wish us all luck. Uh, Andrea Renee is at Dice, hosting an amazing roundtable and overall just being amazing. Alexa Ray is still in space. You know, I mean, after watching the movie Gravity, it's hard to get back from space once you're in there. It is. And she is traveling and fighting the, the tribulations of space time. It's not an easy thing. So our utmost respect to Alexa Ray. Um, we have a show for you. And I say show loosely. We're going to see how this goes. We have your, our news. We have some hands-on shenanigans. And then we have a third segment, which we're just going to kind of whim and hope for the best. We're going to whim? <laughs> We're going to whim. Is that, is that how you say it? We're going to whim? I don't, I, I mean. We're going to go on a whim and it's going to be we're amazing. Gonna, we're going to live okay. our best life in the third segment. Uh, before we go any further, I have to preface this podcast with I am the absolute worst at pronouncing names. So if there are any names in here, and there are a lot of names in the news this week, I'm going to butcher them. But you're going to love me anyway. It's going to be fine. It's we good. could turn it into a game. Okay. Actually, turn it into a drinking game every time Britt mispronounces something. Take oh, a boy. Shot. Your liver's going to hate you. <laughs> or we could do really well, and you might be sober by the end of this podcast. Uh, I got a lot of whiskey here. I don't know. We'll see. I'll save it. I have zero booze in this house. <laughs> All right, Samer. Do you want to kick us off with the first piece of news? Yeah. But first, did we want to tell people? Well, I don't know. There's like the subscribe and Twitter thing. Are we supposed to do that? <laughs> well, we can. All right, let's do that now. Oh, no, you know what we should do is we should definitely. <laughs> oh, wow, we're really terrible at this. Andrea, please come back. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, you should, if you're listening to us and have not joined our Patreon and have the means to even like throw us a buck or two, we would greatly appreciate it. You can get exclusive posts because Brit's the bestest ever at social and Patreon. Aw, you're um, so sweet. And you can join our streams and all sorts of information like that. You can find over on patreon.com slash what's good games. Yeah. yeah, speaking of that, we just uploaded our Patreon exclusive studio tour video today. So if you are curious to know what our studio really looks like, make sure you subscribe and you can see that fiasco for yourself. It's wonderful. Yes, I believe that's the that's the one dollar because it's an, the yep. monthly exclusive video. Exactly. You know. It, cool. Right? All right. Yeah. News. All right. Ba -da -ba -da. Roll it to to the news. Oh God, is this gonna be like? No, this is fantastic. Let's go with it. I love <laughs> no, it. No, what, what I what I just reminded myself of, and that's a really bad example. Have you watched Parks and Rec? No. Damn. I know. John Raffio is a character and he sings things like that and I feel I just feel dirty now. Um anyways. <laughs> so <laughs> we got some news. The first thing being the Sledgehammer leads moving on to other Activision projects. So Glenn Schofield and Michael Condry, I'm assuming that's how you say their names, um, are co-founders of the Call of Duty developer Sledgehammer Games, but they're leaving the studio behind. Uh they well, oh, <laughs> Brit's, Brit's like, oh, what? What? <laughs> oh, what? Um, they announced that the veteran designers who directed last year's Call of Duty game will move on to other roles at Activision instead. So I think that's interesting to note. That it's not like they're leaving Activision. They're right. just leaving a particular studio. Uh, we thank Activision for the wonderful opportunity to create and lead Solitaire Games, said Joe Field in a statement. Now it's time to try other things. Activision has offered me the opportunity to focus my energy on something I'm very passionate about, exploring new game ideas for the company. It's something I just couldn't pass up. So, uh, I mean, there's a lot more here talking about gobbledygook, but I kind of feel like we don't need that. Th those are the main things, yeah? Well, I mean, I think it's probably They're worth noting that uh, the studio will continue working on all planned World War II content despite mm. this shakeup. And to replace, is it Schofield or Schofield? One or the other, I apologize. Oh, that's a good question. I don't know. <laughs> um, to replace Schofield and Condry as head of Sledgehammer Games is Aaron Helen Hallen, who most recently, Hallen, I told you I'm drinking already, who most recently know. worked on one of the downloadable map packs for World War II. He was one of Sledgehammer's founding members and previously was a lead designer in all three Call of Duty games as well. So, Call of, all the Call of Duty games at that studio. 
worked on, obviously. Right, right, right. Um, so, yeah, I guess uh, these folks... Oh, so the other thing that's kind of neat is, like, Condry and Schofield, or Schofield, or however you say his name, because now you have me doubting <laughs> what I said. <laughs> that's what I do. Uh, the earlier credits include these games like Dead Space and Legacy of Kane, Soul Reaver. So I am curious to see if the new passion project means finally, like, new IP other than the, the Activision staples, like Call of Duty. That would be interesting. Um, I was reading this story, and remember all that shenanigans with, um, gosh, Infinity Ward? And so Sledgehammer yeah. Sledgehammer was originally working, like that, like it said, um, on Dead Space and all, a bunch of other projects for EA, and they kind of split off, and they pitched, it was like a third-person Call of Duty game to Activision. And Activision was like, okay, that's kind of interesting. And then they sat on it. And during the time that they were sitting on it, it was on all that shenanigans with Infinity Ward, went down with Jason West and Vince Stampella. And then they pulled in Sledgehammer to work on um, the, the to, to cooperate, to make the other game. What's, what's, was it Modern Warfare? Was it Modern I'm, Warfare? I'm Warfare? not the super Call of Duty timeline person. Okay. But it was something like that. So anyway, they got pulled away. So now, like you said, Sam, it'll be interesting to see like what it is that they do. What do they do? Yeah. The good the good thing is is that Sledgehammer is obviously like on this three year cycle where um you, you know they just released World War Two, so they have a few years to go before they have to worry about like coming up with the new game. So yes, all will be fine. I'm sure Aaron will do fantastic. All right, Aaron wasn't his name Aaron. Aaron, no. Aaron Halen, the new director. Oh, oh new director. Yeah. Sorry. I, was, I thought you meant like Glenn and Michael. I was like, um, that's not even remotely close to Aaron. <laughs> nay, Summer, nay. Are you okay, Brittany? How much booze have you had? I've only had a little. I've only, <laughs> mis I've only mispronounced one or two names, okay? It's not enough. You made me doubt myself and how I pronounce names. That's what I'm good at, Summer. That's what I'm good at. All right. Making me doubt myself. Very true. Yeah. I love you. Moving on. We have another video game film coming. Confirmed. Sonic the Hedgehog film Dated for November 2019, Sonic the Hedgehog will star in a feature film set to debut next year, according to The Hollywood Reporter. The movie is expected to hit theaters on November 15th, 2019. Sega first announced that it was bringing its classic character to the big screen back in February of 2016. Later that year, Deadpool director Tim Miller signed on as executive producer, bringing along newcomer Jeff Fowler to direct. Fowler's best known previous work is Oscar-nominated short Gopher Broke. I've never heard of that. I'm not a film person. I've Never heard of that either, but I like the name a lot. I do too. The most we know about Sonic's Hollywood debut is that the film will use both live action footage and computer generated animation, which sounds mm. a lot like the upcoming Detective Pikachu movie, which is set to predate Sonic's feature by several months. It's out on May 10th, 2019. Otherwise, details remain scant. Ooh, that's a good use of the word scant. Do you like that? I do like that. I can't take credit for that. This article came from Polygon. Yeah, I know, but yeah. I like it. But, uh,. I don't like we're gonna so we're gonna have two movies with live action and computer generated cartoon. I guess that's not unusual. There's a lot of movies doing that now. Um, I just don't tend to like them. <laughs> like, I like, mean, yeah, that's fair. I mean, video game to film, you know, it's never it doesn't have a very good reputation. So this isn't anything that's too surprising. I just and I don't. Do you want Sonic in like the real world? You know, I can't say that I don't. <laughs> I guess it's true. It's I hope, you don't really know what it would be. I hope like that they run a, a thing where when you're like standing in line to buy your tickets, they hand out free chili dogs. That would be amazing. Sonic's love, Sonic loves chili dogs. I'm not sure. I also like chili dogs. See, so you and Sonic have a lot in common. Me and Sonic might be best friends secretly. Besties for life. Uh, you know. Yeah. yeah. I can't say like you know. I don't know how hard it would be to screw up a Sonic movie. I feel like it's a pretty easy premise. You have a, a blue hedgehog and you know a, a friend named. Yeah, this could go weird. We'll see. Well, they have a good. <laughs> they have a decent animated show, don't they? I'm pretty sure the animated show, uh, is regarded not necessarily highly but like it's a competent show like people like the show um so hope i have no idea of anything about this particular movie but hopefully they're looking to their successes with the animated show and like following suit <laughs> instead of being like let's do something wacky what if it's a movie just with it's like sonic just running around buildings like what if there's no plot He's just got to go fast. He's just like... <laughs> it would be like Goat Simulator, but with like a Sonic game. 
Yes. Like a game with absolutely no point whatsoever. Yeah? Yeah. Okay, cool. So. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, right, cool. No, I was thinking about when uh, I was a little kid, I watched a lot of the Sonic cartoon show, and I actually had a crush on freaking Sonic. He was like. Oh, yeah? Yeah, I don't remember. God, I was so young. I was probably like, I don't know, like seven or something. So you. (gasps) What? You did have a crush on a on an animal. Oh, that's Alexa who didn't. Oh, but you made a face. You made a very judgy face. I did make a judgy face. Yeah, I don't know why I made that. I think it's because now that I'm older, I understand how weird that is. But like, mm. no, hey, those feelings are but totally like, legit. Yeah, you don't you don't know when you're little. Like, you don't you don't know anything about anything. <laughs> you're just like I have feelings, the stirrings, as Andrea calls them. I think. Yeah, you're just like, oh, I like you, and like you you see people getting married you don't really know what it's about but you're like oh they hold hands and stuff that's cool and then you're like okay i want to marry donatello or in your case you're probably like you know what a blue hedgehog might not be so bad no i had a thing for simba which is a lion so i mean that's a thing i think everyone had the hots for simba he was a pretty sexy lion yeah all right so we are totally derailing about crushes on animals (laughs) sexy animals (laughs) (laughs) a naughty dog (laughs) A naughty dog. Yeah. Oh, behave. We're on the same um, page. Yeah. So uh, the next story is about Naughty Dog creative director weighing in on an Uncharted movie. So Dice is this week, if you didn't know. It happened because this is going on a Friday. So. <laughs> Ta-da! Um, during a panel today at Dice Summit 2018, Naughty Dog creative director Neil Druckmann shared his thoughts on the upcoming Uncharted movie and why he's pleased with the approach director Sean Levy is taking with the project. So rather than trying to retell the games, this Uncharted film is going to feature a storyline about a younger Nathan Drake played by Spider-Man actor Tom Holland, which I think is actually perfect considering, like, remember the flashbacks in the Uncharted games? I would say yeah, Tom Holland. Yeah, definitely. A pretty good cast uh, match there. Mm-hmm. Uh, which Struckman believes is ultimately the better option. He says, we've had some conversations with Sean Levy, and he's really passionate, gets it, and I think he understands where we're at. He went on to note that Naughty Dog's feelings about film adaptations of its games has evolved over the years, and now the studio would rather see new ideas on the big screen rather than a direct adaptation of one of its games. Levy wanted to tell a story, uh, a different story than the main four adventures with a potentially, wait, wow, with potentially a young Nathan Drake that fills in the gaps. I think is a lot more interesting than trying to retell Uncharted 1, 2, 3, or 4, Jackman said. He also brought up The Last of Us film and the script he worked on, which was for a direct adaptation. Now that he's had some separation from the project, he's realized he doesn't want a direct retelling of the game to be made into a film. I think that makes a lot of sense because these games are basically... I mean, they're not... There's definitely game components to them, but it's sort of weird pulling out the same story without the user interaction in my opinion no i totally understand um lots of game video movie news this week why am i talking yes. like this um and also not to mention like instead of trying to retell uncharted one through four i feel like if you don't cast nolan north as like an adult nathan drake like the the, the masses will riot there will be pitchforks so i think going with a younger nathan drake is just like the smarter move anyway right totally it's either that or nathan fillion like everybody wants nathan fillion mm-hmm I think we've talked about the Uncharted film before on this show. I think it was like probably around the time we first launched. But like, what are your feelings on an Uncharted film? Like, do you think they can I, do it without screwing it up? I mean, I think I think as long as Druckmann is involved in some capacity, even if it's just nudging the ship, like you know, occasionally, because he's not going to be writing the script, I don't think, or like really on set. But um, as a guiding light, I think. Jackman's really smart, and he knows what he's doing, and I think that the new approach makes a lot of sense. Um, so I would actually go see this, because it is... I think it's also more interesting for the fans of the game. So you get to actually go see something new and versus just a rehash of the same thing that potentially might not be that great, because if you look at... Granted, I know some people pull out the cutscenes and put them together. I don't remember how long those typically are, but, you know, the games can be, like, 12 hours long. So trying to be like, okay, now it's a one and a half hour movie. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Might, yeah, might sacrifice some things that the fans wouldn't like. Totally. I mean, just take Indiana Jones, right? And slap Nathan Drake on it. And you got an Uncharted film. That's going to be successful. Also, I know nothing about film. I'm like not a film guru at all. So like that's my simple solution. I don't know if it's a good one or a bad one. 
So, but would you go see it then? If you oh, are yeah. not, I'll okay. I'll go see any video game film movie like out there. Any? Yeah, I mean, I have to. I, it's, I'm curious. I'm I'm curious, cat, when it comes to this kind of stuff, and I want to see how it works. N- like, even if the film sucks, I think it's still interesting to see how people try to like adapt video games to film. And I'm not. What am I? What? Are you like an A for effort kind of person? Yeah, you know what? For, yeah, I am when it comes to film. I really am. Well, like when it comes to video games, I'm like much more critical. But it's funny because when it comes to film, I have I don't have a critical eye at all. Like if it's really bad pacing, like I've only ever walked out of one movie because the pacing was so bad that even Ooh, I noticed. Movie? Oh, I don't even remember. It was some fantasy movie that came out a couple years ago, and Jason and I just kind of looked at each other and we're like, "Nope, we're out of here." It was it was that bad. Yeah, I've I've had a few of those moments. I think it, mine was the. Uh... The Dark Knight Rises, and we were watching some of the fight scenes, and he's just like so. <laughs> the way they were like punching each other was really weird, <laughs> and Bane's voice was just—I don't know. I just, and then I was super bored. I was just like, "This is a boring movie. What is happening?" I don't want to watch you anymore. Yeah, um, the film but that I, I also say. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Oh no, no, I was going back to topic. So if you want to veer off topic anymore, now's your chance. I was just going to say, I also am not a film critic in any way, shape, or form. Yeah, it's I just not funny. Know, I just know when I get bored during a movie or think something is shot poorly. Yeah, I hear you, girl. The The film that I think could be more difficult would be The Last of Us. Now, last I heard, it's like on pause. It's been a long time since it's been touched. That's, <laughs> That's what she, what she said. said. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I think that one still is technically in works. I don't think it's been officially canned yet. I couldn't find any information on it. Well, I mean, what he's saying here, you know, he brought it up and saying, I, th- I think the pause was like a, was him reassessing what that project is or what movie projects look like from Naughty Dog in general. Mm-hmm. I think now that they have a vision for it, and not necessarily in terms of that particular story, but a vision of like, okay, we're not going to rehash the same content. I think we'll probably see it get picked up, back, kicked back up once, whatever storyline is decided upon. Like, yeah, because it's greenlit. Yeah, because The Last of Us is similar. I mean, if you think about The Last of Us, like in a film situation, I think it would be very similar to a lot of like the post-apocalyptic, like zombie films that you see. But believe it or not, like you would think as making a zombie film would be like an easy feat. It's really easy to screw those up, and so that's the one where I'm like. Eh, I don't really know if I need to see a Last of Us film, but A for effort, I'll see it in theaters. <laughs> a for effort, everybody. A for effort, no matter Good what. Good job. <laughs> Pat yourself on the back. Go home. Have an ice cream sundae. <laughs> Just enjoy your life. Yeah. So here's the deal, Steimer. Is Earlier this month, we chatted about the animated Super Mario movie being brought to us by Nintendo and Illumination, Minions, and mm-hmm. Despicable Me. Also, mm-hmm. there's a Detective Pikachu film starring Ryan Reynolds as the voice of Pikachu also coming out. That's in, so weird. Also coming out in 2019. Do you, is there like a particular franchise that you would like to see made into a film? Or you kind of like stay away from film, you do not belong here? I don't know if it's a you do not belong here. I think it takes the right adaptation of the source. And I think books are a great example of this. For the most part, I think most movies are worse, way worse than the books, which makes sense. Yeah. Because um, the book's much longer, has much more source material in it. But there are some good adaptations. Like, So it can be done. It's not impossible. Uh, it's just, I think, whether or not somebody has the right vision and passion for that particular project Mm -hmm. and knows which elements are cuttable and which are not like I think (laughs) only because maybe I'm playing it right now but I think Persona 5 has an interesting concept there with people's cognition being distorted and like what they view as true in the world Mm -hmm. Obviously, the cuttable elements of those games are things like doing laundry. <laughs> <laughs> well, that could be part of the core film experience. <laughs> you got to get Kawakami to do your laundry um, or to give you a massage so you can do things after you go into the metaverse. But like, I think that there are games that have interesting concepts that could be fleshed out and told mm-hmm. um, in a more traditional storytelling medium. There is a Persona anime. I don't know if you've seen it, but it's good. I, I want, like, I mean, real-ass people. Real, oh, real-ass people. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, not to mention, yeah. we also have the Tomb Raider film as well that's being Coming up. On. That one looks promising. That's, 
that's coming out in March, I think. So not that far away. No. And I think, like we were saying, it's hard when you, you know, have so many hours dedicated to a game. Like, how many hours have you spent across, like, Tomb Raider or Mario games or Pokemon games? It's hard to capture all of that charm and, like, character development and building into, like, a two-hour film without it seeming, like, super-duper rushed, which is something I think the Assassin's Creed film, unfortunately, suffered from. That was... You know, I never watched it. You're not missing out, unfortunately. I fell asleep halfway through. It was... Wow, you fell asleep. Yeah. I was at home, and I was comfortable, and I had a blanket, and I was like, I don't know what's happening. Something to do with, You're like, like some dude, like, on some, like, machine looked like he was being, like, crucified. I didn't know. So I was like, nope. Good night. Goodbye You're forever. like, I've had enough of this. But yeah, I'm, I'm because Tomb Raider does look like it's following the storyline of the, the, the reboot, um, I will be. I think that's a that'll be a good test case to see whether or not it makes sense for movies to continue doing this. Because if that one doesn't turn out that great, I have to kind of agree with Druckmann that maybe we just shouldn't try anymore. <laughs> maybe we should try and tell different stories that have a similar arc or set in the similar world or something like that. But mm-hmm. maybe because I don't because I think Tomb Raider could do it. I don't know if it will. I mean, again, this is me being a film noob, but it's like, again, I go back to my stupid Indiana Jones like example. Like, I feel like if you follow something along those lines, like it's a Indiana Jones is kind of like the Uncharted slash Tomb Raider film version, even though it came way before any of those. And that to me is an extremely entertaining franchise and I love watching them. So I'm like, just, you know, throw in some temples, throw in some skulls, throw in some traps, some spikes, some blood. Some, like, I mean, yeah. falls you should not survive from, but you do anyway. And you have the perfect Uncharted slash Tomb Raider movie. Just don't... I, the only thing that bothered me about the Tomb Raider reboot was the impaling. Oh, that was real bad. You did, you did And I was like, like you would straight up die. I'm sorry. I don't care. Like, that takes me out of it because you would die. Even if it missed <laughs> all of your internal organs, you would probably bleed out. You'd be bleeding internally. It's it- not... And then in the second one, she hits her head like 15 times. Girls got major concussion issues. Well, you know, it's interesting you say that because when we play video games, we're so desensitized to like being shot. Like she got shot all the time, but she survives no problem. But when she gets impaled, we're like, oh, that's not realistic. But getting shot True. dozens of times like is totally fine. It's, it's yeah, interesting. But when you're shot enough, you die. And in that impaling <laughs> scene, there was no way to die. Granted, there are other scenes where you are impaled and die, but... For right. that particular one, it was like a like a strength building moment or something. <laughs> I've been impaled, uh-huh. but I've I can been still walk. I will, I will, stop, I will walk it off. I will walk it off and kill like the next dozens of dudes that come at me. I think she was wolf. It was wolves directly after oh, that. Like wolves well. were attacking her. I was like, jeez. Gigi and Laura. I think the funniest thing at the end of that game to me was she's had the shittiest time, right? Like. <laughs> She's been impaled, she's hit her head, she's cold, she's wet, like, she's had to fight off dog, wolves, not dogs, wolves. <laughs> Technically, hey. <laughs> hey. Um, like, people are shooting at her, she has to learn how to kill people, and then at the end, she's, like, on a boat, she's like, I'm not going home. I'm like, do you not want to shower at least? <laughs> Maybe a nap in a proper bed. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, if you're not watching us on youtube.com slash what's good games, you are missing the fiery passion that's behind Stammer's eyes right now. Her eyes are like as big as planets. Like I think I see Alexa that's Ray orbiting the them. They're so big. They no, girl, are. you were intense just now. It was it was impressive. <laughs> that's just what that's just my face. It's a good face. <laughs> okay. Anyways. That was that was a fun little little rant. I enjoyed that quite a bit. Next up on the news docket, you can now view, edit PlayStation Network profiles on the web. Sony just launched a browser version of its PlayStation Network features, allowing members to access, edit, and view their profiles without having to log into their consoles. My PlayStation is a sleek, easy-to-navigate site that grants full access to all of the features you'd ever want to check on the go. When you log in, you immediately see your friends list and profiles, trophies collection, and messages. There's also a quick menu of who and who isn't online, so if you're not sure if you want to turn on your PlayStation 4 and see, I just butchered that, just to find out who is playing Monster Hunter. Okay, so basically what they're saying, ladies and gentlemen, before my butchering, is that you can hop on my PlayStation and see the hells online and see if it's worth your time to try to fire up an online match. Got it? 
You got that same. Yeah, right? but then what the problem is, like, what if you're all checking that, seeing that nobody's online and then no one ever goes online? Then you need to make friends. That's a catch-22. <laughs> no, I'm saying, like, everyone's like, check it real quick. Nope, Brit's not online. All right, I'm going to go do something else. Yeah. But then the... you're also checking and you're like, she's not online. I'm going to go do something else. Wah, wah, poor Steimer. She's very sad about this. I'm not. I don't care. Thank you. The edit profile section also gives you quick access to important settings, like checking to see if your two-factor authentication is set up and switching up your profile picture if you're bored of it. However, there's still one thing you cannot do, and that is What's that? change your PSN ID. Wah, wah. Wah, wah. So that is my.playstation.com. Well, then what good is it? It's funny when, when they wrote... Um... And this is a Polygon article, mm. but like has grants full access to all the features you'd ever want to check on the go. I'm like, can I change my ID? Nope. <laughs> no. Nope. Then that's an incorrect statement. <laughs> now I haven't used. My understanding is that this is their alternative to their PlayStation app, and I haven't used the PlayStation app in a hot minute. But my understanding is that it's a mess of an app, and it's not very user friendly. So I think this is their way of being like, is this better for you guys? Is this better? Is this better? I mean, I don't see myself using this, but if you're someone who does a lot of online gaming, if you're obsessed with your trophies, maybe you like to look through all your trophies and like rub them in your mind and like polish them till they're sparkly, shiny, clean. This might be the website for you. But I feel like if you were a major online gamer, you would probably have a Discord set up with your friends already and you would you you'd have your own solution to this. I mean, that is true. So this is something that you don't see yourself using is what you're saying. Oh, hell no. I'm not using this. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, someone might somewhere, but it's nice that it's an option, I guess. Um, but yeah, I'm not, I don't plan on using this. It's a thing that exists, ladies and gentlemen. If it's a, it thing, a thing that exists. That tickles your fancy. I'm very happy for you. Tickle, tickle. Tickle, tickle. Well, tickle, we tickle. Simer, we're breezing mm -hmm. through this news pretty quick. We sure are. We have one last story. About payday too. Payday, payday, give me that money, payday. I mean, it's a pretty interesting story. Would you like to read it, or would you like me to read it? Um, if you think it's interesting, you can read it. Okay, will do. All right. Yeah. So Nintendo Switch is getting an outdated version of Payday Two. Now, this game is coming out February twenty seventh, which, as of today, is only six days away. And what's interesting about this is that this news just finally broke, and they got an official confirmation. So. Polygon reports that the, Polygon reports the revelation comes after fan, fan outrage on Reddit after an early recipient reportedly streamed the game before release later this month. <gasps> tisk tisk. Features Don't break those NDAs. Nope. Features such as the ability to speed up the end of high screens and flashbangs were not present during the stream, keying fans into the apparently older software. Starbreeze has since confirmed with Polygon that the version releasing on Switch is not the most recent 147 update. Payday 2 is releasing on Switch with content up to and including the most wanted update, which is equivalent to the content released through mid-2017 on PC. PS4 and Xbox One received additional... Wait. Okay, that was weird. I saw Xbox One and One, like, really close to each other, and it kind of threw me off. Reading is hard. <laughs> it is hard. PS4 <laughs> and Xbox One received one additional update after that, the Master Plan update, which released near the end of 2017, Starbreeze told Polygon. So Switch is one update behind the other consoles, which are slightly behind PC. So this puts the Switch version in last position after all other console releases, which are already lagging behind PC in terms of updates. Starbreeze claims the rationale for this is due to using the build available at the time of console Console submission and stated future content updates are planned for the console. So I thought that was interesting because this game is releasing in six days. And the Reddit group, I'm assuming it's like the payday Reddit or whatever, is like up in arms. Like there's pitchforks, there are fires. People are very upset because they're noticing certain like flashbangs and other things that are available and aren't available in certain versions. And they started putting two and two together and they're like, hey, Starbreeze, what the heck, mates? What version are we getting? And then finally, it sounds like just because they were called out, Starbreeze is like, oh, yeah, guys, sorry. Oh, totally. Yeah. If somebody hadn't streamed that game early, they would. it doesn't sound like they would have told anyone until the game was out, which, by the way, is a terrible idea. Yeah. Like, can you tell? That would really piss me off <laughs> if I paid for something, thought I was getting an updated version just because they didn't communicate that it wasn't. Mm -hmm. Um and I think it's fine that it is behind. I think that they should have been way more upfront about it way earlier. 
uh, and then said exactly what they're saying now, like, hey, we will update it. Like, you won't be behind forever. It's not like we're never going to update this. Mm -hmm. Especially but. if you've pre-ordered it and, you know, that was, like, the console you wanted. Yeah, I, it's just kind of... I mean, shady is kind of a mean word, but it's a, it's a little shady, just bad PR. Um, I don't know why you wouldn't just wait to release it until you have the current version, but maybe, Steimer, you know more about this than I do. It's something to do with the numbers, releasing it on time, contracts, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, I mean, it says, like, they didn't have what they needed tech-wise tech before um, getting it out, and what's like, okay, well, I, if you were going to do that, it's fine. It's just more about communicating, right? It's all, it's always about communication. So as soon as they knew that and they knew it wasn't going to be up to par with the other consoles, they should have just been like, hey, hey, here's the deal, Switch owners. We love you. We want to make this the best for you. However, <laughs> however, to start, I've, this is what it's going to be. Something I've, we're yeah. committed to doing X, Y, Z. We know, like, whatever. It's fine. People are usually fine if you're honest. Yeah, and I think that's something that we've seen a lot of, and I I mean, I would assume most developers and publishers and those in charge of communicating with the fan base or learning is that communication and being honest and transparent is so freaking key because if you try to get, like, anything past anybody, they are there are people out there, friends, who, like, dedicate their lives to, like, finding out what you're doing wrong and, like, finding out, like, secrets about this kind of... You know what I mean? And they will discover it, like, with the whole microtransactions and the loot crates and the um, Battlefront, you know, and, like, all of that stuff. People are like, hey, actually, this is gambling because if you do this, that, and the other, and even with Destiny and some of the shenanigans they were pulling, it's, it's pretty crazy. People got a lot of passion. A lot of time. They apparently <laughs> got a lot of time. They're sometimes real good at math and probability. So, like, maybe don't try and pull the wool over this particular audience. Gaming audiences are typically quite smart and know when people... They smell bullshit from a mile away. Yeah, they do. Yeah. Thanks for thinking we're smart, Steimer. Some of us don't represent ourselves very good online, but I appreciate that vote of we confidence. Smart. We are I smart. mean, we're assholes. But I smart. mean, some people are assholes, but not me in particular. No. I'm great. No, Sam, you're you're a, a cupcake, a sweet cupcake full of sweet sprinkles. Look at I'm that. a mini cheesecake. Oh. I had a little mini cheesecake today. It was very good. Oh, that sounds so good. Okay. Well, friends, still to come, we'll be talking about what we have been playing. But Simon, this is very exciting. Before we get yeah. to that, I want to let you know that this week, what's good game is brought to you by Audible. Guess what, Steimer? What? I love you so much. Audible is offering you, our dear listeners, a free audiobook with a 30-day trial membership. You guys have heard of Audible, right? Just go to audible.com slash good or text good to 500-500. Audible includes an unmatched selection of audiobooks spanning all of the genres, including that fabled story of Andrea's ultimate seal bando, and I'm going to butcher this, in the Peta B trilogy? P to B. P to B? P to B yeah. trilogy. So yeah. if you want to know all about Andrea's, you know, seal has bando, that is available for you in Audible. But if seal men are not your thing and you're like me and primarily stick to zombie fiction as opposed to zombie nonfiction, you can check out some of my all-time favorite zombie novels, such as The Morning Star Saga by Z.A. Recht and Day by Day Armageddon by J.L. Bourne. They're super good. Oh, I love them so much. And if you don't like zombies and you like cool fiction books, because I also don't read nonfiction. <laughs> well, I do sometimes, just not very often. Um, I have been reading American Gods. I'm about three quarters of the way through it, and I love it. It's by Neil Gaiman. He obviously, he's a great writer. I recommend most of the things he's written. Stardust is another great one that was made into a movie. That was fantastic. So to when I was talking about books, sometimes having good movie adaptations, Stardust is one of them. Um, and then also, my favorite book that I read last year is called The Nix, N-I-X. I forget the author's name, <laughs> but it was it was a really good story. I liked it a lot. So, so there you go. Yeah. Just another way for us to bond over something that's not video games. Yeah. A cool thing about Audible is that it lets you switch seamlessly between your devices, picking up exactly where you left off. Whether it's on your phone, through a tablet, or at home on an Amazon Echo, you can get through tons of books, hands and eyes free, while doing almost anything. 
Plus, Audible members get a credit every month good for any audiobook in their store, regardless of price, and unused credits roll over till the next month. Didn't like your audiobook? No worries, you can exchange it, no questions asked. And get this, your books are yours to keep. With Audible, you can go back and re-listen to any time, or re-listen any time, even if you cancel your membership. Go to audible.com slash good or text good to 500-500 to get started today. Hell yeah. Go and get yourself some books. Yeah. There's also a good variety of video game books on there as well. So, like, the ultimate history of video games is on there. All your base are belong to us. Um, I haven't read All Your Base or Belong to Us, but I, I have heard good things. But the ultimate history... Well, now you can just listen to it. You can. And the ultimate history of video games is a great one that I would also highly recommend. So check it out, ladies and gentlemen. And we will be right back with our hands-on impressions. <laughs> Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the What's Good Games podcast. It is time for us to talk about all the things we've been putting our hands on that are video games. I caught oh, myself. Okay. I was gonna say like, cool. <laughs> I was about to go somewhere and I saved it. Steimer. Yeah. You are still playing freaking Persona 5. Well, it's a long video game. <laughs> <laughs> and truthfully, I haven't played a lot. Like my schedule lately has been mostly filled up with, um, with friend dates. That's so... good. Yeah, I'm like trying to talk to people. Wait, are you talking life. about in persona or in real life? Well, both. Okay. Um, so in, in real life, that's the reason why I haven't played a lot of video games. But when I have played, I played most of uh, Monday. I played, I just had down and had like a chill day for once. And I played Persona 5 for most of it. Because um, like, I'm like, can I can I be done with this game now, please? It's about, I'm uh, my game clock I think is... A little over 70 hours, oh, yeah, and I told you where I was, and you were like, I think you have, like, another 20 hours to go. <laughs> at, yeah, at least. Uh, for those listening, like, oh, man. <laughs> she is at, I don't want to say the person's. I mean, I'm in November. In November, right. I'm in uh, mid-November at this point. Right. So, like, are you are you ready for it to be over? Like, where are you at? Like, I think the thing with me lately is that I'm getting frustrated because I feel like I'm not getting through games fast enough, mm. and it's bothering me. And so I'm finding I'm not finding as much joy in the longer games as I normally do. I think if you obviously like I spent 300 hours on Persona 4 Golden. <laughs> <laughs> wow. <laughs> um, and now I just think I'm at a point in my life where I I just view things a little differently, and now I'm much more interested in like. Uh, you know, a 16-hour max experience for the most part. I mean, I'm sure there'll be exceptions to that rule, but I think last year was a hard one because everything was open world and super long, it felt like. Yeah, that was an intense year for for games, for sure. Yeah, so, so yeah, so I'm still playing catch-up on my list from last year. Like, I haven't finished Assassin's Creed either. I haven't finished... Hell, I haven't finished Senua. I haven't finished anything, and I feel terrible... And it's giving me anxiety, which isn't helpful whatsoever. Didn't you make a list a while ago? So like, I do. I still have that list. It's not good. So why are you it's adding like, things? I've, oh, you're not adding things to it, actually. I'm not you're adding right. things. I'm trying, I'm trying to get through the things so that I can feel better about myself and my life. Um, but, I mean, I do. I feel good about my life. Sorry, that was... <laughs> that no, was I, really... I, I get it. I totally understand what you're saying. So, but like, and so I want to ask you, because you you are the queen of, like, multitasking games. Oh and I don't know how you do it, because it's making me want to kill myself. I don't know how I do it either. It's, uh... So, I'm currently juggling a f several games. And I feel like the way I manage my games is I have a game for, like, every situation. So, I've been doing a lot of travel lately. So, that's where I've been playing, um... When I was traveling, I was playing, oh, God, A Night in the Woods. Mm, yeah. And something about traveling makes me want, like, a game specific for my, like, travel. So I recently went to Arizona. And, you know, it's like a three-hour flight. So I'm like, I need something kind of short, sweet that I can just pick up and put down. So I found a game called The Dark Side Detective. And cool. And, Steimer, I think you would love this game. So... How it's described on Steam is a micro-adventure game with a distinct sense of humor. It is developed and published by Spooky Doorway. It came out on Steam in July of last year. It recently came out to Switch. 
And you follow Detective Francis McQueen and Deputy Dooley. I call him Deputy Dumbass Dooley. Cause, oh, cause he, no, cause he's, he's stupid. He's real stupid. And so there You're are real these. Dumb. Yeah, real dumb. So the idea is that there are these portals to this alternative world uh, known as the dark side. And they keep popping up. And I, I've never seen Twin Peaks, but people compare it to Twin Peaks. I don't know how accurate that is, but I'm just throwing that sure. out there. Uh, okay. And so throughout the game, you get six different cases and you have to find these portals and close them down. It's super duper charming. There's a lot of pop culture humor, especially like if you played games or were alive in the 80s and the 90s. A lot of funny references. I was. You were. That's right. You were, girl. And what, why I think you would like it, Simon, is it kind of reminds me of, and again, I'm not super familiar with the genre. I apologize. So I don't really have a lot of good um, examples to like compare it to. But Thimbleweed Park, that sort of like where you, you know, you don't you don't walk in this game. You just stand still and you kind of like hover around and you, you get to like identify and examine all of the items around you. And some of them you get to collect and keep in your inventory, combine or use for like something in another level. Does that make sense? But you don't move? You don't move. No, you just stand there. Um, you and your your companion, Dooley. <laughs> and uh, you just meet a bunch of characters along the way. Yeah. And so you'll like examine like a drawer and in there you'll find a bobby pin. And then you can use that to like lock pick something or do something like that. Um, typically, like this is not my kind of game. But the, the humor and the writing and the game is so like self-aware that it's it's just really entertaining. And it's... The puzzles aren't overly complicated. There were a few that stumped me, but I think that's probably because I'm just not used to this genre and I'm not sure like exactly what to look for. I think it's like thirteen or fourteen dollars on the Switch. Totally would recommend it. Yeah, as soon as because you you texted, I was like, I was, I was sad texting you about Persona. <laughs> I was just like, why is this game so long? I mean, I really like it, but God, I just kind of like, kind of want it to be over and like. I don't know. I've struggled with that too because I still haven't romanced Makoto yet. So I mean, it can't be done. I've got, I've got to level up my charm. You still haven't done that. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I've now only maxed out one of my traits, which I believe was proficiency. Um, and now I have to like work on the other ones and max them out. But the thing is, like, Persona isn't really meant to. Uh, like, you're supposed to play it through multiple times. Like, you're kind of supposed to have another save file where you don't where you're current where you're fully maxed on those traits so you don't have to worry about it the next go around who the hell uh, has time to do that if you do i commend you i sir did ma'am persona 4 golden i played three times because i had yeah. to because i was dumb and i screwed it up um because technically you only need to play that game through twice in order to get the platinum but uh oh, not if you <laughs> don't follow a guide <laughs> um that's a lot of hours dude it is a lot of hours. I think the thing that I'm also struggling with is I, when I first played Persona 4, what really drew it to drew me to it, um, was I was just relaxed and I was having fun and I wasn't worrying about necessarily getting points fast with with um, or I guess not fast but efficiency. I wasn't worried about efficiency at all and I was just enjoying the game and going through and playing. However, platinuming <laughs> Persona 4 Golden sort of broke me. And, <laughs> Now, all I can think about is the most efficient way to do things, and like, am I max? And so, I'm anytime I have a conversation with anybody, I'm looking on the internet to see the best choice so that I know which, um, which will give me the max amount of like friend points so that I'm not wasting my time. <laughs> and the thing is, it's just not that fun to play the game that way. And I think yeah. I'm ruining it for myself because I'm doing that, but I also don't know how to stop because. <laughs> It's this really terrible loop of where I'm like, but if I don't, but even though I know I'm not going to play the, I don't know, I'm struggling. No, I I understand what you were saying, Stimela. I really, really, truly do. I just I'm I feel sorry for you because like that sounds like a very stressful way to play Persona Five. You got it. Like I've talked about, that was my treadmill game, and it was like I got so lost in just having fun and just kind of rolling with it that I would walk like thirty thousand steps in a day because I was like, woohoo! Uh, so like, don't do that anymore. Just you know, try to enjoy it. <sighs> It's going to be fine. I know. It's just hard. It's, it's hard for me to put down, especially because I've been doing it now. And I'm like, I already kind of ruined the game that way for me. So, like, the, if, you, if you are thinking about, if you are a Persona noob, new to this world, don't do what I'm doing. No. Do not look at a guide. Just enjoy the first playthrough. Who cares? Like, because, honestly, that's the most fun you'll have. Yeah. Because <laughs> when you start... 
because what I what I likened it to is it's almost like a let's like work at this point because you're you have a for Persona Four I literally had schedules up I had multiple guides I had <laughs> everything to try and make sure that I would get every trophy for every little thing that was out there and um, it was it wasn't fun no that doesn't <laughs> sound just... fun because I feel like part of the fun of Persona is building those relationships and being surprised, right? By like what the characters have to say or like what events unfold. But if you're like master planning all of that out, I feel like it kind of ruins or spoils it almost. But it does. It does because yeah, like you were saying, you don't get to feel like you're genuinely knowing these characters. You are definitely gaming the system. And it's it's um it puts a damper on it. Like you're, I'm not I'm not like, oh Haru, she's like this adorable Girl, I'm like, all right, what do you want me to say? Look, okay, this one's got the most points. So I'm going to say that. Oh, like, no. And, and um, so I'm, and I'm, I'm kind of, like, mad at myself <laughs> because it's my fault, right? Like, this is my fault. This is not the game's fault, and I still think I'm so in love with how they've done the dungeons. It's far and away way better than Persona 4 Golden, mm -hmm. which Persona 4, those dungeons just felt like a copy-paste each right. time. Um, and these ones have a lot of thought behind them, and there's, like, a reason... I don't know, they're just very interesting. And each one has its own quirks, which I really like. Mm -hmm. But the part where you're doing time management, I've completely... I've fallen into the, into, the, into the hole as if I'm going to platinum it, even though I know I am not. Well, then, you have no reason to continue doing that, Simer. I don't know why I'm doing it. Take, it's, a, take it's a deep breath. <laughs> take a deep breath and walk away from the guides. I believe in you. <sighs> <laughs> I'm going to have to lock my phone in another room and be like, I can't look at it. You got this. I believe in you, Sam. Otherwise, I'll be like, oh, I'll just, no. <laughs> can't do it. Can't uh, do it. What else? I'm sorry. That, was, that went back to the tangent. I don't know. No, no, that's a good tangent because I bet you were not alone in this, in, this, in this unfortunate situation you find yourself in. There are probably many others out there, and there is help out there for you if you are a game, a game destroyer like Steimer. Is there, is there hope for That's me? your new title, The Game Destroyer. Oh, uh, no! <laughs> <laughs> I have also briefly played Secret of Mana on the PlayStation 4. Tell me what you think, because what I found really interesting is the, what I saw. I looked at reviews for this game when it came out, and they were so mixed. Like, oh, the Kotaku yeah. review was brutal. It was basically like, it ruined the three things that made this game interesting. Yeah, and that's what's super... So before I... I didn't read any of the reviews until I spent maybe like three or four hours with this game. And then I'm like, okay, like what are my like colleagues thinking? And you're right. That review completely like tore the game apart. And some of the points I felt like were valid, but some of them were a little too harsh. It almost felt like, uh, yeah, just a little too harsh in my opinion, but Hey, opinions are great. Cause everyone has them. They're all unique. So, um, so I first played secret of mana, gosh, probably like Four years ago, I have um, the cartridge. I busted out the Super Nintendo, and Jason and I played through it. And it was such a fun experience, and it also felt really nostalgic to me, even though I had never played it before. Because you have, like, the 16-bit, like, music, and you have the, the 16-bit graphics, and the sprites. The sprites. And I thoroughly loved it and so I was really really excited to hear about this remake or remaster I get the two confused I don't know people are so picky about what they call it this is a remake question mark <laughs> well that's yeah like ladies and gentlemen if you have like is if, if there's like a definitive definition on remake versus remaster because they remade the graphics instead of remastering old ones is what I would say. But what's the difference? Oh my god, the fly is back. Okay, th so there's a fly that's been harassing Simon for this recording. Anyway, it's fan it's really funny to watch your spaz out. Um, I don't know how I how I how I truly feel about it. So to go through some of like the pros of this, the 3D graphics, some people like them, some people dislike them. I am not particularly a fan of it. It's kind of like that mobile style polygony kind of look, and to me that's just an R cell. It kind of turns me off. They have also completely redone the soundtrack. And what I really appreciate about this is you can switch between the new soundtrack versus the old soundtrack within like a second. You just have to like open up the menu and just switch it on the fly. So that's really Which cool. Which one have you been listening to? I start with the uh, the new soundtrack just to kind of like listen to like what it is. And then I ult ultimately always go back to the old 16-bit classic music. It's, in my opinion, just so much better. The, the new stuff is good. 
but it just doesn't have like the pep and like the energy and the charm of the of the old stuff Mm. uh one of the best features about this is i think the additional story bits so if you stay at an inn um oftentimes your party members will like gather around a table and kind of discuss like what's going on or talk about like interesting tidbits that were not in the super nintendo uh version so that's kind of a cool thing because you get to see some insider knowledge on these characters that you otherwise wouldn't have got there's a game log which tells you what you're doing, where you're going, what's happened. So if you if you lose track of this story, which, I mean, it's a pretty simple story, but, you know, sometimes it happens. Sometimes you walk away yeah. and then you come back and you're like, well, what was happening? Right. <laughs> There's an autosave feature, which is fantastic because the game has crashed on me a few times, which has been pretty annoying. The, what? The new one's crashing on you? Yeah. That's not good. It's crashed on me a few times. I know it's also crashed on a few other people, uh, which is unfortunate, but hopefully, you know, that I'll be fixed with a patch or something. Um, the game is voice acted, and this is also one of those things where people have super duper mixed opinions on it. I mean, the voice acting, it's, you know, it's not terrible. Is, is it the best I've ever heard? No, not at all. But if you take that with, like, the little cartoony you know new graphics i feel like it kind of fits in with it it's just one of those things doesn't bother me too much the thing that bothers me the most about it though is that their mouths don't move like they didn't animate moving mouths oh maybe they're all speaking telepathically dude that's totally it (laughs) (laughs) um you know not a huge deal but it just seems like why couldn't you have given them moving mouths and i can talk about this in a second um, something in the combat they fixed that I really appreciate is that, and I haven't come across this yet, but I've heard people talk about it and I've read that it's a thing. So I'm assuming it's a thing is that in the, in the original when like, let's say you have all, cause you can have up to three people playing at the same time, or you can control all three characters. If you want to cast a spell, you have to open up the radial menu, cast the spell. And then the game essentially just freezes while the spell is cast. So no one can move. Even those people who like had nothing to do with casting that spell. And, uh, I'm sure that was just a limitation of the of the time, but that's supposedly been fixed, which is fantastic. And of course, there are trophies and achievements. So trophies, achievos, trophies and achievements. So the issue I have with Secret of Man on PlayStation Four is I have not seen a compelling enough reason to spend forty dollars on this game when I feel like the original is so much better and that's kind of a weird thing to say but i think i feel this way because when you when you update these graphics it it kind of i i i lose the expectation that this is going to be like a retro style game with retro style mechanics uh with you know silly dialogue and silly mechanics like i said mechanics so take a shot every time i say mechanics so (laughs) so i'll take a shot right now hold on okay (laughs) oh your whiskey's gone i just said um and so the fact, like, the characters' mouths don't move, the fact that um, the combat has more or less stayed the same in the sense that it's, like, you slash your weapon, then you have to wait for the percentage to fill to 100% before you can slash again. It feels almost, like, stalling. It feels slow. It doesn't feel like this is how it's supposed to be. I guess how I'm – it's hard to, like, put this into words because I'm not entirely sure how I feel about it yet. But what I would suggest to people, if I could, is – if you really want to play Secret of Mana, find a Super NES Classic, spend an additional $40, get a plethora of some of the best Super Nintendo games ever made, including Secret of Mana, Super Mario including RPG, Donkey Kong, Country. Donkey Kong, Earth Mountain, and play Secret of Mana that way. Because I feel like this remake, remaster, doesn't do it the justice it deserved. Um, and I know there are some people who completely disagree with me on that. Some people on the What's Good Games fan group page we're saying that they liked this new version better than the original. And, mm. you know, hey, that's that's great. To each their own, man. Yeah, exactly. To each their own. But, you know, I just I think what I'm a little disappointed about is the graphic style that they went with. The fact that, um, you know, like, I guess I would have appreciated some more, something more from it. You know, better, not better. Well, yeah, better graphics. Maybe like a moving, a moving mouth, like, new dungeons something extra because when i'm playing this game all i really want to do is go back and play the super nintendo version that's fair yeah when i saw the art style for the remake i was like mm, no like i i would ra- i i'm with you like i would personally i really like sprites i think sprite art is one of the few art styles that exist that can stand up to the test of time yes and so when they updated it, and yeah, it's sort of like a weird... It does remind me of a mobile title. Uh, 
and I was just not really into it. Mm-hmm. And I do think I'll end up playing that once I, well, we'll see if I finish it, but I'll try, try it, because um, God knows I have a list of things here I haven't finished. Uh, but I am curious to try that. I've told you multiple times, like, I want to try Earthbound, but the thing you've, you've made me nervous on with the Earthbound shindig is you were like, you're going to need a guide. And I'm like, I literally just went talked for like 20 minutes now how I don't want to have to go through a game with a guide. Like, is a guide necessary? I'm, tra- I'm sorry, I'm pivoting this That's horse fine. real, real no, hard. P- pivot that um, horse. <laughs> is, are you, is a guide absolutely necessary for Earthbound, or is it possible to just go through and not really have to, like, have something hand hold me through so- the way? Okay, I'm trying to, like, take my mind back because I basically grew up with this game. So knowing what I know about it, I would say, because I recently played this through with Jason, who had never played Earthbound, and he was super confused on what to do. Now, granted, he doesn't have the patience to learn the story. He doesn't pay attention to dialogue in games. He just more or less likes to just, like, run through it and experience, like, the combat and the game itself without actually paying attention to the story, if that makes any sense. So he was oftentimes confused. Um, you do not need to surprise me knowing Jason. Yeah. He just likes to play. (laughs) He just likes to shoot things and call it good. Yeah. Um, (laughs) but he loved it. So what I would say is like play, there probably will be points where you're stuck, but do not like read a guide and then play the game. Like what I say, it's like, start playing the game, go through it. If you find yourself stuck, give it like some effort to try to figure out what you have to do. But then if you get confused, look at a guide. That's how I would say Yeah, yeah, that's fair. But it's not, not like what I'm doing with persona where it's like, you need the guide right there to. Oh, no, no. there's obviously no nothing like the persona mechanics that you would need in this game. Um, yeah, I would say I don't need friend points. You don't need friend points. No, <laughs> but I want the friend points. I don't know what this voice is. No, that's fine. <laughs> or even what I would suggest is like after you clear an area, like look at an online guide and see if you like missed anything, because mo- most times you can go back into like wherever you came from and get something you may have missed. Because there's a mm-hmm. lot of stuff that you probably will miss if you aren't reading a guide, but it's I wouldn't necessarily say it's critical. And if you do miss something critical, you'll be able to go back and get it. That makes that okay. Yeah, that's yeah. good to know. Because yeah, there's <laughs> that's why I stopped playing. I think it was Final Fantasy 13. That's the one with lightning, yeah. Yeah. Or was that 12? Oh, it's 13. Okay. Um, and I I was at like the first boss, boss, mm-hmm. mega boss man, and. I was like, and I was still at IGN at this point, so I was good friends with Ryan Clements. I was like, Clements, what, what is going on with this boss battle? Like, I can't, I can't do anything. Like, he just kills me. I don't know what's <laughs> going on. And he's like, oh, well, you're supposed to use bloody blah item. And I was like, but I sold that item. Oh no! <laughs> I sold that combat. It was like a combat, like a boost, a buff, or something uh-huh. of some kind. And he was like, well, that. Re- I mean, I'm sure it's not. Impo- game impossible to do it, but, but it, to a newcomer, definitely felt like a slap on the face. And I was like, "Well, I'm not gonna reload three hours later," and because I screwed that up too. Sure. Um, so I'm just like, "Well, I guess I'm done with this game." <laughs> you know, I never finished that. I didn't. I didn't put more than like. 10 to 15 hours into Final Fantasy 13. I even took a sick day off of work. Sick day in quotes. I was not sick. Yeah. Spoiler. Um and. <laughs> I'm sick. <laughs> yeah, that's something I never finished. I should probably get back to that. No, you should. <laughs> yeah. I think you're fine. Thanks. Leave it where it lies. The last game I've been playing, I know you're probably all sick of hearing me talk by now, but I'm sorry you're, no, s- you're stuck good with that me. You're actually playing video games where I'm like, I've played one and it's the one <laughs> I've been playing for seven months. <laughs> I love you, Simer. Um, Is Kingdom Come Deliverance. So... I thought this game has an interesting uh, history, the studio behind it, Warhorse Studios, and so I'll try not to butcher this. So TLDR, the project that was to become Kingdom Come Deliverance, began with a pitch, and I'm going to butcher your name, I'm out of whiskey, I'm sorry, I can't help you, Daniel Vavra, (laughs) who left 2K Czech in 2009. Um, His pitch did bring on the founder of Alter Games, Martin Klimia. I don't care. I'm not even going to try out these names. Anyway. Klimia? You're making it sound like Klimia. 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 K-L-I-M-A. But it has like a a weird thing over the eye. So I'm not sure how to say that. Yeah, sure. Whatever. It works. Anyway, so the long and short of it is was like this project almost failed multiple times. They eventually got uh, funding from a billionaire, which is fantastic. 
and they what's his money doing I, nothing <laughs> They announced um, that they were working on an RPG in 2012. They f- well, they formed the studio in 2011, announced they're working on an RPG in 2012, pitched the prototype. It didn't generate the hype they were going for. So in January of 2014, they launched a Kickstarter. They hoped to get 300,000 pounds, ultimately raised 2 million. And two a, million. Two million. That's a lot of pounds. That's a lot of pounds. I want that pounds in hot wings. Oh, my God. Uh, That... I wonder how much two million pounds of hot wings would be. Oh, that's a good thought. Uh, I want to visualize that. I know, me too. So they ultimately signed with Deep Silver, and the game has been out now for like a couple weeks. Um, I first. What kind of game is this? Because I have not seen the Kickstarter or anything. Yeah, so this is a realistic medieval Skyrim type adventure. Is how I would how I would uh, explain it. There's so I checked this game out. Um, at E3 a couple years ago, and I was immediately drawn to it because I love medieval. However, the thing about this game, and I wasn't sure if I would still appreciate it after this, but I love it, is that there's no fantasy. So it's not like a Dragon Age game. Oh, so there's no unrealistic creatures. You're just like, it would be as if you were living in medieval times. 100%. Yeah, it takes place in the year 1400. Um, and yeah, it's it's a, a super story-driven RPG, you have tons of stats like lockpicking and stealth and strength. Any game where I can steal shit is a good game. So I'll have to talk about the lockpicking in a second. It's a very annoying. Okay, we'll get to it. Oh, okay. Um, Fair enough. No, no, no. It's fine. Uh, So the game starts and you are this dude named Henry and you're in your little village. You're the Henry. And you're the son of a blacksmith and some stuff goes down. There's a lot of, and I believe, I believe that all of, the story, the background story of Kingdom Come Deliverance is based off of true historical shenanigans for the most part. So Warhorse Studios did a fantastic job of going around and there's a tweet put out by Deep Silver or retweeted by Deep Silver today of the realism of certain like churches and buildings and whatever, like however things looked back in the day. And then they recreated it in Kingdom Come Deliverance. So it's very, very historically accurate. It's it's super realistic in the sense that, like, if you have dirty armor or dirty clothes, nobles won't really give you the time of day. If you have blood on your sword from killing someone or something, you know, people might scoff at you or they might run away from you. You have to wash your face. You have to do, like, laundry, like in Persona. Um, <laughs> uh, so it's – I'm loving it because I love medieval time stuff, and I think the story is fantastic. The story, the characters, the acting – it's all so incredibly well done. The, the The issue comes in when it's actually time to play the game. Oh, um, well, that's kind of important. Well, I mean, that's that probably makes it sound worse than it already is. The, so this game launched, and on day one, a 23-gig patch <laughs> was implemented. Like, you had to download a huge patch for it, and there's still a h- bunch of patches coming in the coming days because some certain aspects of it are – borderline broken such as the lock picking is near impossible on gamepad unless you're doing a very easy or an easy chest or door it's like almost impossible with the way you have to do the lock picking um that's really annoying the game kind of it's an open game so it throws you in and it's like okay this is what you have to do and it's kind of like washes its hands of you and it's like all right good luck and there's nothing necessarily wrong with that but when a game is just not super duper polished uh, it makes it almost frustrating and I've been super lucky that I've been able to play a lot of super duper polished like AAA games in the past year. So I'm really accustomed to like that level of attention to detail and and whatnot. So this was kind of like an eye opener for me. But af- after I was like, okay, this is fine. Like this isn't Ubisoft and this is not an Assassin's Creed game. Like this is an indie developer and what they've made is something really cool. So what I, what I would say is if it's something you – are interested in that you think you would enjoy give it a couple weeks let these quality of life patches uh come into play and i think you will enjoy the game much more i'm already hooked so i have to play it i can't not play it at this point because i'm like oh god it's so good (laughs) but there are some things of it that are slightly aggravating um but you know like i said they're fixing they're fixing it warhorse is aware of these these issues but i I really enjoy it. I'm super duper like hooked on. I, I set down Xenoblade Chronicles to you for it. I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah. It's, Are you going to go back to Xenoblade? I will, but I'm so like enthralled right now with this world. And it's, a, it's just, 
and what I love about it is I love how, like I said, historically accurate everything is. So it, it's fascinating to me to like go into like a church of those days. Oh, and this is the other thing that's really neat about it is there's tons of like, if you find the church um, in a village or a town or whatever, you'll get a little prompt saying like codex updated, you've discovered the church. And then you can push down on the D-pad and it opens up your menu. And then it has a whole bunch of information about churches from those era, from the from that era or bathhouses or how women were treated or like, I am a black, the son of a blacksmith, so I'm not literate, so I cannot read. So I have to find someone to teach me how to read, and I have to practice my reading skills. Um, oh, that's kind of interesting. The alchemy is the most intense alchemy I've ever seen in a game. It's not like in Skyrim or whatever, when you find the ingredients, you just have to push like a button, and then it auto-crafts it for it you. It crafts it, yeah. It's like, okay, you have to pour your – okay. So before I get to this, because this is relevant – the, one of the biggest issues with this game right now is the save functionality. The only way you can save your game is if you sleep in a bed or... Oh, I hate that. Or if you drink these things called Savior Schnapps, which is like an alcohol. <laughs> I'm not making this up. <laughs> okay. Okay, that kind of is dumb to me. I'm like, you're going to have a hyper-realistic game and you're going to name an item Savior Schnapps. Like... <laughs> Come on, man. And there is a f- Just put in a regular save function like everybody else in the world. Right. And I'm not sure why they went this route unless it was to prevent you from doing something that you can do like in Divinity Original Sin, for example, where you can spam save. And if you screw up, you can just reload and keep. But who cares? Let players play the way they want to play. Right. So I'm not sure if that's what they're going for. But the, so the frustrating part is that if you're in the middle of nowhere and you've spent a long time getting to the spot where you've gotten to, you suddenly have to go. If you don't have any savior schnapps, you can't save your game. You literally cannot do anything except for backtrack to a bed. No. And that, so they're aware of this. No, 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 no. Okay, good. <laughs> they're, no, no. Like, what, what year is it? <laughs> no, that's exactly, yeah. It's definitely the save function and the lock picking because the lock picking is, is, is required for certain quests and I literally mm-hmm. spent two hours I'm not lying to try to pick this chest that was supposed to be easy girl so I had to drink my saver schnapps before I attempted this lock picking because the lock picks are like $15 or something which is 15 whatever and you don't have any money you're freaking poor you can bear, and you have which to why you're trying to steal shit in the first place I have to buy food to eat because you have to eat um, anyway, so, okay, I'm rambling. So Warhorse is very aware of this and they are implementing, I think it's like patch 1.3 or 1.35 or something coming hopefully within a week or two. Um, and it's going to implement a save and exit functionality, which, okay. I mean, that's, Duh. yeah, but it, it's, there's still no way to, I think, save the game on the go unless you have your save your schnapps. Anyway. Um, wait, what? Wouldn't you just exit? You, you can, you can save and exit and just boot it back up again. I imagine, but I don't think there's. That's what I would that does that make sense? Like you can't just save it on the go and continue playing. You'd have to save and exit. Oh, yeah. I see what you're saying. Um so anyway, the alchemy. So I have to craft save your schnapps so I can save my game right now until this new patch is implemented. So the alchemy, it's like you have this huge station in front of you, and this is super realistic as well. It's not like I said Skyrim. So you have to pour like your wine base into the cauldron, then you have to set your ingredients on the shelf, then you have to grab a handful of your first herb, put it in the in the um is it pestle and mortar? Is that what it's called? Sounds correct. Yeah, and then you have to go and grab another one, put it in, grind it. Then you have to start. Yeah. You have to pull on the string thing six times to get your cauldron to start boiling. And pull then, six times on the ceiling <laughs> if you want. And to. then while that's happening, you have to grind your other herb, and then you have to combine them, and then you have to wait for it to boil again, and then you have to grab a file and fill. It's intense. So this sounds like taking <laughs> Professor Snape's potions class, <laughs> and that. It's somewhat appealing to me. It's and that's the thing. It's super. It's super like hyper realistic. Besides the whole like saving schnapps thing, which is a little ridiculous. Um, I've never played a game like this before, but I'm super duper intrigued in it. I see it as one of those games that you just play and you just kind of get lost in because it's you know you have no hand holding whatsoever. There's a great tutorial. The tutorials are there, but they're all like picture and text based. There's no like okay like l- let me hold your hand through this. So, um, yeah, talked a lot about Kingdom Come Deliverance, but I really like it. I think it sounds interesting, though. So, like, I'm glad that you told me about it. I'm happy I told you about it, too, and you should play it. But I know you're not going to play it for a very long time because your backlog is a bit crazy. Ugh, don't remind me. I think, like, there's some I'm just going to have to straight up abandon. Yeah. Like, like on, and this pains me to say because I 100% of the first game, but I think Shadow of War might not. Oh, wow. I feel like no one's uh, talked about that game in a long time. I just, like, there's other, other things. I'm going to finish Persona 5. Um, I'm going to finish Hellblade. 
I'm going back to Frozen Wilds. Like, those are things I want, legit want to do. Uh, and then I might, like, Assassin's Creed Origins, I'm, I'm enjoying the game. Uh, and, I, and I do, like, I'm not done with it. I want, but I'm not sure if I will finish it, if sure. that makes sense. Yeah. Like, I have more to play, but who knows if we'll finish that campaign. Uh, I have things on here like Pyre. I never finished Pyre. I loved that game. Oh, yeah. But I never finished it. I don't know that I will, even though I adore that studio and I adore their art and I adore everything that they do. Um, I just went ahead and crossed off South Park. I'm never going back to that. I mean, <laughs> I mean, I didn't. I wasn't enjoying myself anymore. No, so. and that's that's like I said. I put down lot. Were you on the show? You weren't on the show, or were you on the show? When I talked about Lost Lost Fear. Oh, yeah, yeah. You said you were you yeah. were not not feeling it. Yeah, I, I officially retired that one, and it hurt a little bit. But hey, you do what you got to do. Sometimes not not all games speak to you, and if they don't, time to move on. Yep, the like Call of Duty is another one. I, I started playing that campaign. Never, I'm not gonna finish that. There you go. I'm like, I'm sure it was good, but hmm? yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Again, it's and it might be one of those things that like you might feel the the urge. You might have a, a particular itch to scratch. Like I feel, I, I kind of want to watch some hunky men. In the Call of Duties. I mean, they're real attractive. Oh, they are so, extremely attractive. Yeah. yeah. If, if I'm feeling, like, particularly lonely one night, <laughs> <laughs> maybe I'll fire it up and, uh, <laughs> and just take a gander. At the Call of Duty men. At the Call of Duty men. Well, this has been a long hands-on section. Or maybe it's been that long. I feel like it's been long because it's just you and I talking. Yeah. Mostly me talking. Rambling. <laughs> I've been rambling. But I'm real excited about these games. You're not rambling. You're being informative. Oh, good. You make me feel and good. And I would now like to inform you of our second sponsor. Could you? Really? I would love to. All right. So this episode of What's Good Games is also brought to you by Ripped Gamers. So this time of year is right around when most of us have given up on our New Year's resolutions to get back in shape and have most likely resigned ourselves to feeling unmotivated again until next January. Tisk tisk. It's really like we just started this year, guys. It's okay. Um, but it's not too late to get back to your fitness goals, and Ripped Gamers is here to help. Created by personal trainer Tim Ross, Ripped Gamers is more than a fitness program. It's an online community of people who enjoy what you do, video games. The big problem with our hobby that we all love is it often requires us to be pretty sedentary. Is that how you say that word? <laughs> sedentary. Sedentary. I'm like, da -da, I could read words. I think I said it right, too. I, we'll I'm see what literary. happens. I'm literary. I'm <laughs> literary. But uh, Tim is here to help you get physically fit without compromising your gaming lifestyle. His goal is to help gamers everywhere get healthy and feel comfortable with their bodies. He's lost over 40 pounds personally, and he's adamant it's very simple if you do it right. Tim is giving away a complete step-by-step -step training and nutrition program you can use to begin your fitness journey. You can also join the Ripped Gamers Facebook community for advice, support, or just to meet some gamers who have done or are doing the weight loss journey with you. If you're really serious, he even offers one-on-one -on -one entirely online coaching. You can sign up for this from anywhere in the world. What's kind of crazy, though, is like everything at Ripped Gamers is completely free. And yes, you heard that right. 100% free! Weird voice again. Sorry. Oh, that's uh, the voice. program, <laughs> The program, the Facebook group, even the one-on-one -on -one coaching. This is not a gimmick, and you do not need to put your email address or credit card in anywhere to access everything you'd ever need to get lean. Tim really believes in giving for the sake of giving, and I think that's pretty damn cool. Mm -hmm. If you want to kickstart your fitness journey and get started working toward your goals, head over to RippedGamers.com, download your free program, and join the community. Everything you need to lose weight is right at your fingertips and 100% free. Woo. Yes, thank you, Ripped Gamers. All right, ladies yes. and gentlemen, coming up, the garbage, the garbage fire segment where Simon and I are going to talk about whatever the hell we want. Stick yep. around, <laughs> or don't. We'll love you either way. Welcome back to the garbage segment of the What's Good Games podcast. So, we don't have a lot of plans. We don't have a lot of structure for this segment, but we're just going to start talking. Well, yeah, we are. And I think... Uh... I have an idea for the thing we should start with, and we'll see where it goes from there. Oh, boy. So, you know, the internet, I would say, if you knew of us together at any point in time, it would be because we like to talk about Bioware. 
And in particular, Bioware romances. Bioware and I, banging. Yeah, on our personal channels, we had some videos where we talked about our favorites and our least favorites. Uh, looking at you, Egg. Oh, yeah. Egg. So Egg is soulless. Head. Soulless, for those of you yes. who are like, who? If you haven't yeah. played Dragon Age Inquisition, that's who we're talking about. He does you real dirty. Oh, my God. Like, even worse than Blackwall, which I didn't think was possible. No, Blackwall's really bad, too. I'm trying to think of, like, who was the first Bioware character we bonded over? Was it Alistair? It was Alistair. Alistair from Dragon Age Origins. Yeah. Because so, we were like, oh, my God, he's the best. He's so cute. He's so charming. Cause, he's so funny. Oh, he is. Because I started blogging on the IGN blogs in 2009. And you were, were you working at IGN in 2009? I was working at, yes. I think so. I think so. Yeah. And that's how we ultimately, I think, started talking. And then somehow we started talking about Dragon Age. And then that turned into an Alistair infatuation. Yes. Uh, I still I, I still am very disappointed with what they did with Alistair and his face and his hair in Dragon Age <sighs> 2 and in Dragon Age Inquisition. You know, his face has just gotten more and more busted over the years. And I don't <laughs> He's know a king. why. He's a king. I understand. Stuff happens. But, like... Dude, you look like a total different person. But I... also, you think, oh no, what if this is what happened? Oh, no. So, he's king, right? So he's hearing all of these things, all of these opinions from multiple people. He's getting lower and lower self-esteem. And then, because he's king, he's got a lot of money. So he secretly goes and gets plastic surgery. But he keeps doing it. And uh... then, he just looks like a completely different person. And you're like, but Alistair, Why? Why you do that to your face? Why you do that to your beautiful face? You know, that could be what happened. Because I do remember in Dragon Age 2. Wait, is it called Dragon Age? I can't. Yeah, Dragon Age. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's called Dragon Age 2. I don't know why I brain farted on that one. I'm not firing <laughs> in all cylinders, as Simer could probably tell you. Uh, <laughs> I guess there's a moment. Is is it Isabel when she, you, you meet Alistair and she's there? Is it Isabel or Isabella? Isabella. Isabella. And someone makes I'm a like, comment. I'm grabbing my phone. I'm like, I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty so. sure it is. All I remember is there's a moment where you're talking with Alistair, and I think she's in it. And there's, I think it's them two. And there's a conversation, something about we all, your face looks different, right? Or something. And she's like, yeah, we all do. And that was a fun little jab at the fact that none of the characters really looked, uh, you know, the, the same. same. Yeah. I mean, they had to, like, Isabella, uh, I mean, they needed a refresh to make them more distinct. Not Alistair. Alistair didn't, but... What happened to him? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know, man. But, like, yeah, when Isabella's in Dragon Age Origins for, like, a hot second, mm -hmm. um, she looks like every other NPC, I'm pretty yep. sure. <laughs> so, I'm trying to so remember. I mean, what did Colin look like? He looked weird, right? He looked, He had the weird hair that everybody had, that weird crispy ramen hair. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, he was just, like, a blonde, generic bro. Yeah. From what... And so he, yeah, he also had no visual style. He he was wearing just the regular Templar armor. He looked pretty much like your average Joe back in that time. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And then when they updated him with that sweet ass lion cape, <laughs> Mwah. doesn't he have like some black like fur garment that like drapes over him as well? Oh my god, he's or is it feathers? It's, it's uh no, it's fur. Oh, okay. he's got fur. Oh, he's got the fur. He's got fur. He's a he's my sexy Simba throwing back to the no, beginning of this podcast. Cyber, no, <laughs> but he's he's got a lion helmet. How fucking cool is that? Come on, man. Oh, oh. For those listening, we in the, in that appreciate us and love us unconditionally. We appreciate you. Thank you so much for listening yes. to us. Um, the other romance that you and I well, I don't know if you would you call well the shenanigans of Geralt in The Witcher. Mm. That was something else that I remember you and I were texting nonstop because there was, there was a hot minute there when we were like on the same page, like same in terms of like the story advancement, like we were in the same part of the story, but then you yeah. like obviously owned me and you got way ahead <laughs> of me. But I remember like we, we fretted a lot about girl and his shenanigans. We did. But I mean, I always was a Team Yen person once she showed up, finally. Yeah, it only took you three games, girlfriend. <laughs> only took me three games for her to finally get her ass in there. But to me, I'm like, oh, Yen's so pretty, and, like, she's so strong, and she, like, she's cool. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she's kind of a dick sometimes, but who isn't? Right, right, right. 
I remember it was hard. I'm like, because I, I liked Tris because like she was in all the other games. So I kind of, she was in all of the other ones, right? Yes, yeah. she was. Yeah. And so I, I had a, a bond with her. But then I was like, if you if you read some of the the story and the lore, that's not included within The Witcher. You know, you, you learn like Yen is a very, very big deal. And is like a critical part of uh, his life, Geralt's life, Ciri's life. And I feel like that's just the right choice. Or you can try to romance both of them and see where that gets you. Oh, spoiler alert, nowhere good. <laughs> but, um, I mean, yes, the Yen, Yen is like the mother figure to Siri, and that's, to me, the canon choice. I think the thing that really bothered me most about Triss was she lies to you yes. to get you into bed. I'm like, that's, do you want to be with someone like that who's completely manipulated your choices? And I know that Yen's made also other mistakes, but... Mm -hmm. Just at the end of the day, I think when you've built your relationship on a bed of lies, <laughs> it's probably not going to work out for you in the long run. No, not a good. No, not at all. Um, if you're wondering, also, friends, why we talk about this so much is this is actually something that people request Simon and I to do is just banter about Bioware romances or just romances in or general. romances in general. Um, I feel like the Bioware romances are the ones that really have got our go. Like, obviously, you have your issue with Caden. Um, oh, I love Caden, but then he was so mean. He was so mean. He literally made you cry. But he did. okay, okay. Here's a question: What was worse, Caden or Egg? <gasps> or Blackwall? Black, black, Ooh. Blackwall. <sighs> oh, that's a hard. Spoilers within for that's Dragon a... Age. If you if you yeah, haven't played sorry. Dragon Age Inquisition, I mean the game's very old. You should have played it by now. But if so not, Mass Effect, so, so like, is Mass Effect. Yeah, get it together. Um, I guess. I, I'm going to say Caden only because I had more of a, a connection and the, and that was more devastating to me, especially because I felt like I didn't have the dialogue options that I wanted. I guess I felt that way a little bit with Egg too. Egg. Um, sorry. Sorry, I'm going to keep calling him Egg, but, <laughs> <laughs> but um, for Caden it was like. I had a legitimate reason to not contact you. Oh, hey, I was dead. <laughs> Actually, 100% dead. It's not one of those things you say when you're ghosting someone. Oh, I was dead. <laughs> like, you, I was dead. Dead, dead, dead. Like, I was literally dead. I'm sorry. Literally I, I, dead. I cannot no help pulse. you. <laughs> no pulse. <laughs> and for, for him to just be like, oh, I see you're alive and hanging out in the galaxy. Like, what? What? <laughs> That was definitely I, one of the more frustrating moments where it's like, I have so much to say, but I don't have a dialogue option to, to tell you how I feel and the things I want to say. And uh, then you get your letter from him. And he's like, sorry. And you get your letter. Yeah, I was like, sorry for being a butthead. And you're like, all right, well, God, I forgive you, what's I up, guess. What's, what's up with these Bioware men doing you dirty? Like, there's all, And then there's Egg, who pulls like the ultimate, like, hey, guess what? Guess who I really am? Egg is the ultimate betrayal. Yeah. Because he doesn't even... So, um, sorry, yeah, we're totally spoiling this. I don't care. Um, so, yeah, he turns out to be not who he says he is. And he turns out to have been the cause of the entire events of Dragon Age. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and he, like... Well, it's not really confirmed whether or not you sleep together. I'm going to uh... say that... It, in my version, you do. Like, they're kind of left left it up to your headcanon. Right, right. Um, and I'm going to go with yes, you do, at some point. Because otherwise, that would be really weird to me. Um, so, like, gets you into bed, and then it's like, BT dubs, I'm the dread wolf. <laughs> <laughs> and no. that's my orb, and I'm going to destroy the whole world now, so <laughs> I'm going to leave you. And peace out, Girl Scout. Bye. He just ghosts yeah. in the ultimate worst way. Like, that's the ultimate ghosting, right? Like, mm -hmm. I am, by the way, basically going to destroy everything. Thanks yeah. for the sex. I'll see you later. <laughs> and, and, yeah, that was a uh, – I think you streamed that that DLC where you learn all that information, right? And uh, Trespasser, yeah, where, where it reveals – because you, you knew – you Answers were sort of there at the end, but like still kind of vague. And Trespasser definitely clears a lot of things up. Right. Um, and then you have Blackwall, 
Yeah. <laughs> who I was totally going to romance him. Like, that was like... When he said, as you wish... Mm-hmm. So, like, part of the, the intro phrases or whatever, um, like, when you walk away, he'll be like, uh, or you're like, oh, I'll see you later. He's like, as you wish. And you're like, oh, Princess Pride! <laughs> you're so sweet, and you're like, muscle fire... Not fireman. Uh, woodsman! Woodcutter, bearded wonder of hotness. Yeah. Um, yeah, and then you find out that he's freaking not who he says he is. I don't know why I'm trying to hide the spoilers because like I feel like we spoiled everything at this point. Um, yeah, but you know that was a that was a heartbreaker. So when Samer and I get together and we've had some drinks, we tend to kind of like go on these tangents where we just talk about how the men of Bioware have done us wrong. Oh, what? the worst part about no, it's just when you're like how they've done you wrong, and I'm like the worst. I think the worst part also about um, the Blackwall slash Rainier um, reveal is. After you bang, he leaves you. Oh, he yeah. just like, like it's like you wake up the next morning to a note. I swear <laughs> to God, if that ever happens to me in real life, I would hunt that person down and hurt them because that's bullshit. You better be there when I wake up. Them's the rules. You can go the next day, like after we've had breakfast. If after you're like, we've I'm had gonna breakfast. Go, that's fine. But to wake up and you not be there? Mm-mm. <laughs> that better be an emergency of epic proportions. Stammer is not down with that action. See, this is why, like, Colin's romance I very much appreciate for reasons you said before. It's like, I like you. You like me. We both have some shit. We both have our own problems. But let's you know what? Let's work through them together. Let's make it work. And we'll bang. And it'll be great. I'll be your, I'll be your, I, w- I was going to say, I'll be your Bufasa because there's this whole lion thing going around, but I, that, that sounds a little weird, <laughs> but I, ca- I got to roll with it now. And I also really like the Alistair romance. Um, granted, as long as you're a human. Right. A human noble. Oh, yeah. A human noble. Uh, you know, you're good. If not, I, I would be so frustrated if I was, was your first playthrough a human noble, Steimer? My first playthrough was a human man. Oh. Noble. Oh. Oh. Because I didn't like the character create. I felt like I couldn't create a hot enough chick, um, <laughs> and so to my to my personal standards, and therefore I played as a man and I romanced Morgan, who is also another frustrating oh, that's, romance. Yeah, that's a frustrating one. <laughs> I wonder. I feel like there's really there's really not very many non frustrating romances. There's not a lot of people are. you can depend on in the Dragon Age and Mass Effect universe. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> It's true. Everyone has their their ulterior motives, and they're all using you for one way or another. I mean, not maybe that's true, you know. And, and that's freaking screwy, and it's terrible. And Bioware, yeah. should, and Bioware should feel bad for making us bad, make us us feel bad, but don't because well, we appreciate it. <laughs> it's a weird. Relationship. What I would like to see more from Bioware is less the push pull, right, kind right, of relationship, right. and something that's more. I and mean, granted, not that it's not realistic, because that. It happens all the time. I see friends where that's happening to them, and I'm like, this is bullshit. Yeah. Um, but I want them to to tackle more things like Colin, where it's what a mature relationship should be. It should be like, hey, I like you. You like me. You want to do the thing? Yeah, let's do the thing. Cool. Like, we'll go on our merry way together mm-hmm. instead of like, I want to be with you, but I can't be with you. You're like, yeah. well, why? Just yeah. tell me, tell me your shit. What's going on? And something that I would also like to see is I feel like all of the relationships are very slow burns, right? In the sense that it's yeah. like you don't really get to bang and tour until like the end of the game. And it's like I would like to see more of an established relationship explored throughout like half of the game. And maybe you break up. Maybe you get back together. Something like that. Yeah, they had they played with it a little bit in Andromeda, which right. I appreciated. You can bang feet. Um, feet. PB, PB, PB. You can you can bang PB. You can also bang um, Liam. That took me a while to pull up his name. No, <laughs> I was like, what's his name? I know that's, that's so unfortunate. <laughs> like Andromeda, honestly, hasn't even popped in my head. I, I, that's so sad. Uh, I like Jaw though as a character. I thought that was an interesting romance because it kind of reminded me of Alistair. I think is why because he's like the super naive alien, it's like weird alien cat, alien cat man with the weirdest and most revolting chest I've ever seen in all of my years on this planet. Seriously, I've like, <laughs> I don't know that I've ever seen an anatomy. <laughs> That would make me nope out faster. <laughs> just 
as soon as the shirt came off, I was like, Ugh. put it back on. Put it back on. For the like, love of whatever holy entity you worship, put it back on. <laughs> I can't look at your weird concave chest where it looks like, I don't know how, I don't know what's, what's happening back there. I don't want to know. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be curious to dissect one of those and see what happens. <laughs> That's why I get, like, any of, because if you, correct me if I'm wrong, you romance Scaris. Accidentally, yes? yeah. I, I was I was with Caden. Um, I was committed to Caden, and then in Mass Effect Two, I took my flirting a little too far with the Turian, and um, I came back to my office, and Caden's photo was face down, and I had to reboot my save. But yes, I did. Gotcha. Because like I've I've never been one who was like Garrus is a great romance. Because I'm like no, Garrus is like your best friend, and I think it's important to have different types of relationships out like. You have your best friend. You have your partner. It doesn't need to be the same person. It no. can be. Like, but you're you should have a variety of people in your life fulfilling different roles. If you try to make one person everything, it's probably not gonna work out for you know yeah. in the long run. Yeah. Um. So to me, Garrus, I'm like, no, no, no. Like, it's ruining something so pure and wonderful. <laughs> It's just like a beautiful friendship. But what I feel like was cool with Garrus, and this was a long time ago. I was like just barely like moved out of my parents' house when I played this, I think. Uh, so this was very, very long time ago. I feel like the relationship I was building with Garrus was more of like a friends with benefits thing. I And I could be wrong, but I feel like it was more like, hey, you want to try this interspecies sex thing and see what happens? Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I don't know. He if, had a right. Yeah. No. I don't know if it was. I had reached. She had flexibility, I think is the line. Yeah, there you go. I don't know if it was super duper romantic. I don't remember it being that way. Maybe it's because I was so appalled at my actions of accidentally cheating on my boyfriend. But hey, <laughs> it happens. I I mean, it gets more romantic for what I remember. Because I saw the, um, the the romance scene and it's like, he's sweet and he's scared. Cause sweet and scared. This could kill you both. Uh, or actually probably just kill you, which he would feel bad about. I oh, yeah. Imagine. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Hi, I killed my friend because we were trying out some sex things and it didn't go so oh, well. Oh, God. Hey, that should totally be a thing, a route. <gasps> that could have been the final ending to Mass Effect 3 that we didn't get. That does happen. So in Mass Wait, Effect what? 2, if you take Morinth instead of Samara mm -hmm. and you romance her, she kills you. Wait, really? Yeah. I never knew about this. Yes. Holy. It's game over screen. Oh, so what do you do? You reload. <laughs> And you don't agree to sleep with her. Because oh, she's, okay. she's the type of Asari that kills their mates. Black Widow. No. I mean, yes, but Do that's like not what that? they're called. I know. I, what are they I called? Felt smart. I, I, I felt smart just now, Simon. You totally ran on my parade. <laughs> sorry. Like a Black Widow, baby. Sorry. Let me look up what she was called. Arda Yakshi. That's right. Oh. She was an Arda Yakshi. But yeah, so if you, if you bang her... Game over. <laughs> you see a game over screen, <laughs> which I think is pretty amazing. So um, what do you think about romance and Anthem? Do you think it's going to be like a thing? I hope so. I think it's an expectation at this point of the studio to have romances. Mm -hmm. I am curious to see how that would go because the game type is so different from anything they've done before. And it's designed to be played with friends, and I don't know what's happening if you're in the middle of a romance <laughs> screen and your friends are waiting for you to be done so you can go oh, yeah. on a mission. Um, I, I, I don't know how that will work, but I hope that there's something there. Like, even if so, did you play uh, Knights of the... Not Knights, yeah, uh, The Old Republic. No. So, it's an MMO. MMOs typically don't have romances with NPCs, but they worked it in. Granted, it wasn't the world's most profound romance. Like, it wasn't uh, the same level as their regular RPGs, but it was there. You could romance your companions, and I did. Ooh. Who did I I can't remember the guy's name. I was a Sith. So, that's interesting, because I can't... I mean, I don't know if it would go this route, where it's like... If you are an anthem, can you potentially romance like a character that's played by another player? You know what I mean? Yeah, we, if we can romance each other. Yeah, but like, see, what if we give each other gifts? Gifts and something. Yeah, and like, and the, 
I don't know. Like, could that could, would that be a little too weird if you like roam? Because do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Weird uh, in the I sense, do. like, do you get the banging scene? Or I don't know. Oh, yeah. I, I'm just pr- I'm processing this processing this out loud, so I'm not sure like how I feel about it. But, yeah, that would be. Yeah, the, I don't I guess you wouldn't. Um, but if you, how did it work? So in um. That game you love so much, Asheron's Call, uh-huh. where you could get married to another character. But there was no, it was just an item, right, that you would give to someone? You didn't have to build up to it? No. So, no, you have to, uh, oh gosh, this is so much fun. You have to do, there's a quest. And both players have to give each other a ring. And then you have to do a quest. So it's like a two-person dungeon, but the dungeons are separate. And you have to defeat monsters that represent, like, envy and greed and all those That's things cool yeah and then at the end of that um i can't remember exactly how the process went but at the end of that you are married and there are like wedding um uh, locations you can choose from and you can buy like a wedding cake and you can buy other stuff and i think you can do the ceremony there i i mean i went through this but it was a it was a while ago so i don't remember the exact step so maybe something like that like in mmos like you said, that you don't really romance NPCs, but you could hold weddings between characters, especially the people who do a lot of the role playing, right? Yeah. So like that's an option to just have it be. I think it would actually be really interesting, what you said, as some sort of a quest where mm-hmm. you have to go like, fight this monster and it drops a thing so that you can make the ring or whatever. Yeah. Um. Or alternatively, do follow kind of what they did in the Old Republic and have. NPCs that are romanceable, but it's just not the full fleshed out romance that you would expect from the RPG version. So there wasn't any, I'm trying to remember, I don't think there were any like banging scenes in the Old Republic. Uh, It was just basically like, I like you, you like me, we're dating, and hooray for us. And that's it. And that's it, I think. It's been a while since I've (laughs) played it, but. You know, I could. Hmm. I can see how it could be worked in. I mean, if you think about it, it's just like you playing with all of your friends and there's yeah. going to be a main story, main campaign to follow. Like what's to say you can't romance Joe Schmo and your friend can't go romance Ben McGee. I don't know who Ben McGee is. I couldn't think of another Joe Schmo. So I went with the made up Ben McGee. <laughs> I do think it'll be interesting to see how they handle cut scenes and stuff though, because are they going to do the thing where they ignore, like there's one main person mm-hmm. and the rest are sort of just conveniently erased from the cutscene. Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, or is it going to try and be inclusive and have everybody there? Because what if you and me both want to romance Joe Schmo? Then I would assume, like you said, yeah, we would probably get the separate cutscenes. Because I, I can't imagine that Joe Schmo would want to have a love triangle with hopefully millions of players. So can you imagine millions of players in, like, the single cutscene? Everyone's, like, trying to get Joe Schmo's affection. I mean, it wouldn't be millions of players, and it would be up to four, right? Because that's the group. Oh, that's the group size. I wasn't sure. Yeah, I guess size. we don't know. I don't know enough about Anthem to, yeah. Oh, you're right. Okay, that was a bit of an exaggeration on my end. But my point <laughs> remains. But I'm saying, like, out of the out of the four people, if, uh, yeah, again, like, I don't know if they're doing, because I don't, even Destiny, like, pretends like the other people aren't there. Right. Um, And talks to you as if you're the only one. Yeah. So they might, they might go that route, and then you just, do you have to play through that mission again or something? I don't know, to talk to that guy? Or they would probably just do something where it would be a separate thing. Like, so there's a main story quest, but you probably can't romance any of those characters, maybe. I don't know. Mm. Uh, and then, but there might be people in the hub worlds, mm. like merchants or vendors, that you could strike up a conversation with, maybe flirt a little bit, see where it gets you. <laughs> And then what if you, like, could marry a merchant and then you got everything there for free? Or it was, like, a Skyrim thing and you, like, take them back to your house and you put them there and you're like, we're going to get a dog, too. And you just make yourself a happy little family in this very small world. I love you so much. You have ideas, Stammer. I think you should be in game development in some fashion. <laughs> oh, hell no. I would be the worst. I'd be like, well, what about donkeys? And they'd be like, what about them? I'd be like, I don't know. Maybe can we ride them? <laughs> ride a donkey. A selling and they're like, point. you have a jetpack. Why would you need to ride a donkey? I don't know. The donkey would be like the back of a box art, and it's like you can ride donkeys. Like three exclamation <laughs> points. Like dash. Christine what if the Steiner. donkey had jetpacks? <laughs> oh my god, I love it. <laughs> donkeys and jetpacks. That sounds like a t-shirt idea if I've ever heard of one. I mean, it'd be pretty cool. It could be. Well, 
I feel like we've talked a lot about bio romances. We and just have, romances in general. I mean, it's like our bread and butter. It so. really is. I get like super duper like into in game romances, probably like on an unhealthy way. The, I've honestly had to start it's to me worse than Disney or worse <laughs> than fairy tales, the telling this stuff to little kids. <laughs> Because it's interactive, and so you feel as though romance should be a thing you can win. Yeah. Not how it works, as I have discovered. No, it's because it's <laughs> I'm like, not. okay, and I've literally this is and this is bad, right? Like, but I've had the thoughts of like, it's sort of. Do you remember that song, Jesse's Girl? Yeah. And he's like, hey, I'm doing all the things, right? Like, I'm making, I'm being funny, I'm taking notice of you, and like. You're supposed to love me back. Why don't you love me back? And I feel like video games, Bioware in particular, kind of reinforces that. Like, hey, I've done X. I've done Y. I've done Z. Where is my reciprocation? Yeah. And people are way more complicated than that. They really are. And it's it's interesting. I've uh, played a lot of Harvest Moon in my day, and I've talked about this before. But in Harvest Moon, you know, you give people, like, eggs and turnips and potatoes and and walnuts, and then they're like, oh my god, I love you so much, this is so awesome, and all you have to do is give them a gift every day, and then talk to them, and it's like, yep. wow, you're better in your relationship, and your friendship, because you're paying attention, and you're giving this person gifts, and every time I'm, like, done around, like, done playing a Harvest Moon game binge, which is usually, like, well, now these nowadays it's story of seasons, but the binge is, you know, usually 50 to 60 hours, I, like, walk away from that, and for, like, a few weeks, I have, like, this revelation, like, it's really easy to be nice to people, and it's really easy for people to to notice you all you have to do is talk to them give them vegetables every day i mean the vegetable <laughs> part kind of a joke but it's 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 I true really, no i'm gonna do this now if i find a guy i like i'm gonna give him some sort of food item every day right and see what he says it's it's just interesting the the psycho- here's an apple yeah like the psychological effects that immersing yourself in a game really has on you you know in that sense when it comes to like people and romances and stuff like that it's granted like we're it's fine. We're not, we don't have like no. this illusion. What? No. <laughs> I, mean, no well, I mean, I'm not fine, but <laughs> um, my question to you is because you, I don't know if you've ever felt this, but I've had the thing, especially with, with the romances we get really into, like Alistair or uh, Caden mm-hmm. or Colin, I would say I get when I'm playing them. Cause at the time I had a boyfriend, <laughs> I would be more I would be disconnected with him and I'd be like, no, Caden's my man. And like I would get it was really bizarre. Mm-hmm. But I would become more disconnected from my real life boyfriend playing through the virtual with the virtual boyfriends. Because they were it I don't know, it was whether it was something about the chase that they give you in those games or the satisfaction of like, yeah. Yeah. I landed it. You know, like I don't know what it was, but have you ever had that or are you like wait no like I'm normal <laughs> no 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 I've totally had that because uh, okay good I was like please don't <laughs> no when I was playing Dragon Age Origins and even Dragon Age 2 I was in like a super duper like committed relationship that obviously failed um not because of video games I was about to say damn blame a Bioware for your failed but romance I- <laughs> <laughs> but I think a lot of that has to do with you're right like when you're in the game like you know, obviously these characters are professionally written, like they're quote, perfectly imperfect humans and they're designed to be attractive and appealing. And there is that chase and there's that excitement of knowing that at any given moment, you're going to have a cut scene with that character and you're going to experience something with that character. And I think that's just, you know, indicative, indicative of you not getting what you need from your real life partner, right? Like that excitement isn't there. The the uh, attraction or the the flame is no longer there. And it's funny because I also had this revelation when I was with my ex and I was like, I don't think this is how it should be. I shouldn't be more excited about like romance. Like it, it is true. So what you're saying is that my relationship should have ended a lot sooner because I knew when I played Mass <laughs> Effect. Well, shit. <laughs> I mean, it's true, right? Like, well, so what I- you're saying is that, that since J- since Jason, you have you didn't feel that with say anything in 
Inquisition. I horror. mean, like I get super duper into the romances. It's fun because it's like a gameplay plot and spot. But it's I'm not like I I wouldn't think about. It's leave- not that same feeling. No, I wouldn't like leave Jason for like Cullen or Alistair or like Prompto. You know, like even if they were real, if Cullen shows up my more <laughs> at my door tomorrow. <laughs> I would drop whoever I was with. But see, here's the thing is, do you really... But I'm also not with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> so, like, the bar's real low. <laughs> but here's the thing. Do you even know Cullen, though, really? Do you really know Cullen? Like, you just know the game designer. But, like, so that's why it's like, obviously, I would not leave Jason. I mean, if he but... showed up in those furs, like, it'd be kind <laughs> If he showed up like no. Simba with the theme, Lion King theme song playing in the background... That's all it would take for you. That would be real weird. Yeah. No, I wouldn't. I wouldn't like the Lion King theme song. But if he had the fur cape, and was holding his like lion helmet, <laughs> first off, I'd be. I would ask the question, "How did you get into my building?" <laughs> then I would be okay with it, and say, "Come on in." Oh man, the water is fine. Oh, I love it so much. I love you so much. I love that we can have these super duper weird conversations, and hopefully, you know, our our listeners won't drop off the face of the planet and backflip off the planet goodbye and forever. But you know, yeah, please no. Now, now you've seen us, friends, and and heard us, and you know how weird we really are. And you yes, love us. This is love this you. is the true nature of us, Brittany and I. <laughs> oh God. Well, I mean, on that note. Uh, I have, a, <laughs> I have, I have a shout out to give. <laughs> this is such, this is going to be so awkward, but I want to do this. Um, listener Casey Biosphere wrote in, uh, his little girl, Cheyenne Marie had a t- turned 10. However, her party had to be canceled because she had the flu. No. So we are sending you Cheyenne and Casey our warm regards. And we hope Cheyenne is feeling so much better. And I'm sorry that this shout out came at this moment in the podcast when it's probably a little awkward for you. A little inappropriate. So what I would suggest, I really hope (laughs) that Casey is pre-screening this. I hope so too. (laughs) And then we'll just turn it on for this part and then (laughs) move on with his life. (laughs) Move on, yes. Uh, Yes, Cheyenne, hope you're feeling better. And thank you, Casey, for sending us the email and listening to our, our show. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been an episode for the books. This has been an episode. That's an accurate statement. <laughs> for the books, or is that too much of an exaggeration? No, just, I, don't, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what that phrase means. I think it means Does it's like, mean it good? like a momentous episode, like a historical episode, either good or bad. Okay, yeah, yeah, <laughs> then yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so, so much for listening. We can be found on social media platforms across the big old internet. Twitter.com slash what's good underscore games. Facebook.com slash what's good games. YouTube.com slash what's good games where we upload our video casts every Friday. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're on Instagram, but that's kind of a thing that doesn't matter. Um, <laughs> when- I love how Instagram just gets the shaft every week. I'm it's sorry. like, eh, don't bother <laughs> following us there. You can check <laughs> us out on our website at whatsgoodgames.com or if you feel like supporting us on Patreon, patreon.com slash what's good games. If you are a patron, our patron exclusive streams will be Monday, February 26th. We do not have a time set yet, but please tune in. We would love to see you in the chat so we can conversate also yeah. con- conversate you like that also we have a pax panel Steimer. we do we yeah. do and i'm trying to remember when it is so let me pull it up real it's quick in april because that's when pax east is so you got like a month but put us on your calendars anyway until i'm making i'm stalling for time no i'm good until thank you, you. i'm good okay. now i appreciate you all right, so our PAX panel, PAX East panel, titled What's Good Games Live, will be Friday, April 6th at 3 p.m. in the Arachnid Theater. Why is it spiders? I don't know. I'm not a fan, but hey, that's what we got. Uh, we will also be hosting a meet and greet somewhere. Details to follow soon. And It'll I, be around the time of the panel. Yeah, sometime ish. after. Either before or after, yeah. Yeah, oh, yeah I guess after, yeah. Probably after. Um, I think that covers it. Steimer, did I miss anything? I don't think so. I think we I think we did an okay job. <laughs> <laughs> well, hopefully we won't be put in this position again. But it was very fun to talk all the Bioware romances and all the romances. I know Miss Little Andrea Renee's eyes would have glazed over. Obviously, Alexa would have been perfect for this conversation. But again, space is hard. 
So no one can blame space her for that. Space is hard. You can't talk in space. They can't hear you. Nope. It's a vacuum. Nope. nope. Just ask Commander Shepard. Oh my god. Oh, that got deep. That got deep real quick. All right, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for listening. And we will see you or you will see us and hear us next week. Is that an awkward enough exit? I think it's, yeah, it's sufficiently perfect. awkward.